Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea You won't see the show on your TV So we talk about things musically Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea you're listening to Jams and Tea Well. Welcome, everybody, to a brand new Record Club episode of the Jams and Tea podcast, where we spend the jams and spill the tea, and today we are covering quite the remarkable record at the behest of Morgan today. We are talking about legendary jazz musician John Coltrane's album, Ascension. Yes, Mm -hmm. we are. Um, Right. So, um, Morgan, why did you want us to talk about this album? uh, yeah, so uh, Ascension is the first album that Coltrane released after the the landmark that is A Love Supreme. And, you know, it's obviously an impossible thing to think about how one would possibly follow up a record like A Love Supreme. Um, so basically by doing... In so doing, he uh, said, fuck it, and made the, the wildest <laughs> jazz record ever, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, probably God, not ever. But. God, God damn, man. That ain't an understatement. Is it, is it all right with y'all if I do my review first, just because I have been reading a book about Coltrane this past week? Yeah. So I feel like I have a lot of... Uh, specific contextual information that feel might like help. it could inform the rest of our uh, contributions in a, st- mm. uh, possibly, in a sense possibly um is that all right if i go with you? yeah, is that right with yeah you? go I'm ahead sweet okay so yeah morgan's right this is the first uh album coltrane released after after a love supreme was released um although he had been incredibly busy at the time it was during a, a streak of years in which, which in, involved like dozens if not hundreds of studio sessions um with a variety of musicians although this was capping off so okay this was i believe the first or one of the first times that coltrane expanded from what had been for the past three or four years leading up to it, a pretty consistent um, quartet of players. Freeform jazz, very, Jesus very Christ. apt. So uh, the four-piece quartet of A Love Supreme and many records prior are expanded to, pause for effect, an 11-piece for this recording. And um, what an 11 piece it is. And I think it's worth establishing all the players by name from the outset. Yep. Um, the original classic quartet uh, that recorded Love Supreme and many other great records. Coltrane on tenor sax. McCoy Tyner on piano. Jimmy Garrison on bass. And Alvin Jones on drums. All four of them are here. But this time... Garrison is joined by Art Davis, a second bassist. Uh, Coltrane is joined by another two tenor players, Fero Sanders and Archie Shep. Coltrane also hires two trumpeteers, Freddie Hubbard and Dewey Johnson, and two alto sax players, Marion Brown and John Chikai. I apologize if I butcher that name some more. Um, it's a collection of not only the best talent around, but the best names, really. Yeah, great names all around. Um, this, I believe, is a conscious attempt from Coltrane to continue pushing a variety of avant-garde jazz known at the time colloquially, colloquially as the new thing uh, <laughs> in a further direction than it had maybe ever been pushed up to that point clearly influenced by the free jazz of Ornette Coleman. Um, But also this just kind of feels like a natural evolution of many of the more fiery, manic and atonal performances that Coltrane had brought to his live scene on records like Live at the Village Vanguard and Live at Birdland. Uh, Having released A Love Supreme five months prior to when this was recorded in February of 1965, and continuing a long run of remarkable commercial success for challenging jazz music, Coltrane sought to push his sound to new heights, likely conscious that the audience would be smaller, 
but I'm sure hoping to some degree to shift them into a new mindset, a new way of approaching, conceptualizing, and executing jazz. The cacophonous sound of ascension is therefore quite intentional, and to me also represents a further expression of the searching spirituality of a love supreme. Where that record patiently pushed at convention without disregarding it entirely, soulfully but methodically exalting God, ascension is a blinding rush of religious fervor, perhaps an attempt to simulate the essence of the divine and the unknowable, to communicate that God truly is in all things. These are just my scattered thoughts, though I do think it's impossible to truly analyze the sound and impact of any of Coltrane's late era works without accounting for how fervently and openly spiritual they are. Uh, in bringing together this 11 piece, which incidentally was originally intended to be a 12 piece with a second drummer, Rashid Ali, who ultimately declined to join the session. Can you imagine Ascension with two drummers? I mean, Jesus. I mean, and, it sounds uh, like there are already four drummers. Not to mention <laughs> the fact that those two drummers would be... Boost. Not to mention the fact that those two drummers would be Alvin Jones and Rashid Ali, who are b both two of the fi most fiery jazz drummers uh, working at that time. This is so and, fucking good on this. And Ali has expressed... Uh, great despair at the fact that he passed on the opportunity <laughs> for this. I fucking would too. Yeah, yeah I mean, mean Rashid Ali. Rashid Ali actually would go on to join Coltrane's um, troupe just after this record for many. I think almost all of the rest of his records. And I think I mentioned on a podcast episode a few weeks ago they did a a record together, just the two of them, Coltrane on tenor and Rashid on drums. They made a, a concept record about the solar system called Interstellar Space. That was just tenor and drums, and that's quite a good record that I strongly recommend. Um, but anyway, I digress. And bringing together this 11 piece, Coltrane in many ways, before you even put the needle to wax, is making his own statement of purpose and furtherance. You've had the new thing, years of it. This is different. Uh, I want to also preface as well by saying that each of us are going to be reviewing edition one. Of, uh, of Ascension. There are two editions of it. What that means is that the piece was performed, the recording was done twice, the piece was performed two times in the studio, uh, and ultimately the decision was, was made to release both recordings rather than just pick the best one. Um, so I want to add a few things to clarify some context. Uh, edition two, uh, confusingly, was actually the edition recorded first uh, and I believe edition two was actually Coltrane's preferred edition of the two. Uh, and honestly, I can see why, uh, even though they're both very similar. Uh, but generally on edition two, the solos last a little bit longer and they're slightly better sequenced. Where edition one goes tenor, trumpet, tenor, trumpet, tenor, alto, alto. Edition two goes tenor, trumpet, tenor, trumpet, alto, tenor, alto. And it breaks up the sound of the solo, so you never get the same instrument soloing twice in succession. That said, edition one does have its charms. It does include a short but sweet solo from Elvin Jones that does not appear on edition two. Uh, I do prefer narrowly edition two myself, especially because I think that Jones hardly needs a solo because he's practically dominating the mix most of the time in both recordings. His playing is almost is blistering and almost world consuming. But I will emphasize that it doesn't, I don't see it as an issue that we're only reviewing one edition because they are very much of a piece. Um, they're both collective improv improvisations, so they're different, but the ideas and the general effect of the sound is the same. Um, but yeah, we are gonna just discuss uh, edition one. Uh, so, okay, let's, here's my breakdown of edition one. Immediately, from the outset, you're greeted with these intoning, almost welcoming sax lines that eventually clash and diverge while Tyner gently sets the scene. Coltrane leads off the soloing and his fluttering squall is immediately recognizable, characteristically unpleasant, but also involving. It wrestles with your attention and even attacks it at points. It's simply fucking brilliant. 
Uh, Dewey Johnson's trumpet solo is comparatively straightforward, and he almost seems at points to be struggling against the battering assault of Jones on drums, but there is still plenty of textural flavor, even if this solo, I think, does get a little bit lost in the mix against Tyner's relentless pushing and the ominous edges of both bassists playing. Uh, then you get Fero Sanders' solo, which is violent, atonal, sometimes genuinely fucking terrifying to listen to, as he elicits the most inhuman and pained sounds from his tenor, gleefully writhing in the murk, but also constantly pushing forward, wriggling. It's like a fight along the path to divinity. Uh, he, he even seems to be egging on Jones with his playing. And you can listen and you can hear towards the end of Sanders' solo that, um, that Jones kind of ups the aggression in his drum fills to match Sanders' intensity. And when they're kind of going together towards the end of that solo is kind of just like, holy shit moment that I just love. That interplay is one of my favorite parts of the whole record. Um, then you get Hubbard's trumpet solo, uh, the second trumpet solo on the record. It's much more colorful than Johnson's, I think. I will say I think that Freddie Hubbard is a better trumpeteer than Dewey Johnson, although both are very good. Uh, I like how Freddie Hubbard's solo reaches these squalling, almost scratchy heights, and then it kind of playfully descends. It's a really rich and cheeky performance, I think, that steals the spotlight in a big way. It's a big highlight. Um, in fact, Sanders and uh, Hubbard soloing back to back, even though they're obviously separated by one of the ensemble interludes, uh, is just an incredible bit of sequencing that uh, really steals the show early on. Uh, but it's not that the rest of the performance fails to live up to it, far from it. Uh, Shep's solo has a lot to live up to after you've had two of the most dynamic and ostentatious tenor players give it their all. But his tenor solo does not disappoint. It's wrigglier. It's more esoteric and stop start, but it's no less remarkable. Each time it seems like he might be playing coy, he throws in a line or a progression that just burrows its way into your head. It's a very good solo. Uh, and then you get the first uh, alto sax solo, which is John Chakai's solo, uh, which introduces the familiar but distinctly flatter tones of the alto sax relative to the tenor anyway, and they wriggle effervescently. Uh, note also how the during this solo the bass uh, wrinkles into focus here too, and also Elvin Jones takes the chance to ramp up the rambunctiousness of his own playing. Um, Brown's solo enters curiously, Marion Brown's alto solo enters curiously and in an attention grabbing fashion. It consumes the right channel of the stereo mix and it sits as one of the more blaring and declarative solos on the record. It's earthy and it's deeper and more monstrous tones. Big highlight. Um, then you get Tyner's solo, which is long awaited and flavorful. Uh, the true work of a master at the height of his powers is a strong case for Tyner. I mean, I don't know, really know how you would dispute uh, Tyner is the greatest jazz pianist of all time. Um, it's, this is the, <laughs> he's working at the peak of his powers here. Uh, and I mean, just for God's sake, if you haven't heard of Love Supreme, listen to that fucking record because he just, it's insane on that record. Uh, his solo is long awaited and play, flavorful, as I said, uh, and you can feel him kind of being pushed to the limit um, by this performance. Uh, and it's no surprise, I think, to learn that after this record, uh, soon after this record, Tyner would leave Coltrane's band and be replaced by his wife, Alice Coltrane, uh, because Tyner felt at this point as though his contributions were being drowned out by the sheer force of this new band. And that is a certain thing, and then it is a thing you notice at, at certain parts of this record that the brass section really, and then I guess, and the, and the woodwind section, I guess, because obviously saxophone is a woodwind instrument, really dominates the rhythm section, uh, with the exception of Jones, obviously. But you've got um, the piano and the bass sometimes kind of buried in this record, uh, which is clearly something that Coltrane anticipated, but it does make it even more sweeter when they kind of rise to the surface towards the end here. Um, Tyner's delightful solo gives way to the eerie bass duet of Davis and Garrison, and they jaggedly tease out the possibilities of their strings. 
And it man they manage in a fascinating fashion, I think, to continue the same overwhelming cacophonous energy, despite the fact that all the horns at this point have fallen quiet. Um, Jones throws in some tension building fills to exacerbate this vibe, and it gently sets up his own all too short but show stopping solo that I find uh, blood quickening, basically. Uh, just really, really incredible moment when, when uh, Elvin comes in for his solo um, towards the end here. Um, that said, I've talked all about the solos. It's easy to focus your attention purely on the solos. But there is also, I think, a lot to admire in the cacophonous ensemble sections throughout this piece. Uh, the more you focus in on them, I think the more you find your mind being pulled in different directions by the clashing instrumentation. Uh, I really adore the way that the ensemble pieces sometimes crash into focus abruptly, but always on beat in a kind of exhilarating fashion. Uh, see, for instance, the dramatic resurgence of the ensemble after Johnson's solo, or the brassy blare that joins Shep as his solo wraps up. Towards the end of Marion Brown's solo as well, you can faintly hear shouts in the background of the recording, which I can only attribute to the band getting so swept up in the fire of their performance, uh, and just kind of like not being able to stop themselves from vocalizing the ecstasy that they're feeling. Um, the ways in which each musician seems to preach with their instrument and you feel that when the band come back in it's almost as though they could summon God into the studio. A divine energy just radiates from the chaos here. Uh, perhaps the finest single moment on this recording is the exact point in which after minutes of more minimal soloing the band violently snap into focus at the very end of Jones's solo, leading the track out with a glorious ensemble piece that captures the energy of Ascension at its most unbridled, pure and gloriously unified. Here is a piece that never lets up, that constantly barrels through everything in its path in service to the divine. A group of men submitting the strength of their power to something greater than them. It almost feels like it's hardly for us to judge or evaluate. These are unarguably some of the best players in the world at their respective instruments at this time, playing like they might never get a chance to play again. If there is an afterlife, one imagines that the arrival fanfare might sound something like this, a feast for the senses and for the spirit that overwhelms as much as it wraps you in warmth and glory. Yo, yeah. mm. damn, that was wow. That's probably a lot better than what I had to say. Damn, I, I really <laughs> love doing this podcast because I'm just here being like, I'm a potato with opinions, and then Tyler, everyone <laughs> else, is like, here's everything look, I know. Look, see, we I are am all, a potato with opinions. We are all potatoes with opinions here. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, does anybody mind me going next? Yeah, go ahead, dude. I kind of um, wanted you to go next. Cool. Um, so uh, overall, my thoughts on the album are very similar to Tyler's. Um, I would say the only sort of, um, the only way I differ in interpretation really is that, of course, you have to address the spirituality of Coltrane's music at this point in time. <clears throat> But to me, it always feels like an act of worship, not to uh, not to God, but to music itself. Um, because mm -hmm. it's something about this just feels so, something about Ascension just feels so raw and primal in its energy. And tons of records sound that way. Like those are two adjectives that we use to describe music all the time. But I mean, I don't think it applies more strongly to any record I've ever heard than Ascension, maybe. Um, and really all it is, is, you know, they have a key and a chord structure and it's 11 musicians being told to go ham. <laughs> and it's, it, it, if it, it's basically, it, it sounds essentially like an extended jam session that was recorded and put out but 
once you start to peel back the layers, you can see like even though the solos are obviously improvised, what a how structurally masterful this is as a compositional piece. Um, it just it it never lets up, and it ne- it, but it also never gets tiring to listen to. I think it's just consistently exhilarating, no matter what edition you're listening to. Just because I mean the whole thing, just to use a, a very basic comparison, the whole thing feels like you're watching the very last scene in Whiplash, but like yeah. for an entire forty five minutes. But just with the intensity and the emotion and the passion on display and the dichotomy between the players and the chemistry that they have and the fact that everybody on screen and off is just doing the best work that they have ever or maybe will ever do, you know, just going like they will never get to make art ever again. It's put on the Ryan Gosling voice. It's all very exciting <laughs> the the Sion sono approach yeah but oh god this is totally a Sion sono thing jesus i bet he loves this album <laughs> no cap just, just everything in the kitchen sink um but yeah i my thoughts on records like this tend to vary a little bit i would point you towards trout mask replica yeah, I was gonna. I am um, so glad you said that yeah. because I absolutely referenced that in my yeah. uh, what I've written. Yeah, and it's a it's an easy point of comparison. I think the biggest difference is that um, uh, Coltrane knew how to play his instrument <laughs> and knew how to compose music. I wasn't a um, sociopath, but it's fine. Yeah, that's true. That's also true. <laughs> um, but I don't. I don't need to get into that. Um, yeah, this is just a consistently exciting, exhilarating record that kind of peels back so many layers of structure and musical ideas, and just just pure how things sound to such a degree that you kind of have to reevaluate why you why and how you listen to music in the ways that you do and how you appreciate them and it's just uh, so the only flaw that i really have with it is just that it is not always it's not easy listening you know <laughs> it is not something that you can just throw on and jam out to whenever you know at least not for me mm-hmm. um it's it's a very special record that i have to be in the mood for that's funny. I listened to it like three times in a row before we recorded this, and it's yeah, just yeah. Like, I think that's a very on point Tyler ism. You know, I think the thing is, like, once you kind of can pull it apart, and like, once you're aware of each kind of different component of it, it just becomes a lot more manageable and and easy to listen to. Uh, yeah, if certainly. you just kind of put it on and shut your eyes, I think the way you should listen to it the first time you hear it is to just put it on and, and mm. sit back and just let it wash over yeah. you. But eventually, um, you, you're not doing it a fear reading if you're not like actually look at, listening to who's playing and what they're trying to do with what they're mm. playing. Even if you don't have the musical theory knowledge, you don't really need it. You just you can get feeling out of listening to the texture and what the person yeah. is doing with their instrument. And and I think that leads me on very well to what to what I think I have to say about the record. Yeah. Um, because I think I'd be an awful person to go last to, to cap this off. Um, so I'm just going to start talking now, I suppose. Um, I'm really glad that we have uh, people like Morgan and Tyler on the podcast who maybe have more of an appreciation for the intellectuality, I suppose, of uh, what some jazz is doing. Um, I gave myself. Well, a- I would actually. I want to. I want to stop you right there, sure. just to address something very quickly. The um, the sort of intellectual way in which I talk about jazz is the only way that I have of expressing how deeply emotional the best of it makes me feel. Yeah. Um, because that primarily, I engage with jazz as an emotional experience. I just had really, yeah. especially with the. Coltrane in this era of Coltrane I have difficulty 
putting those emotional responses into words you know no, I, I appreciate that and i think i uh, i think i really understood all of that but there is with jazz a more uh, theory driven thing happening than is maybe more inherent in other genres I what, what's interesting about that observation though is is that it's, it's absolutely accurate there's definitely uh, a language of jazz that um the more you understand the language of jazz the more rewarding each individual jazz record is but what's interesting about that in the context of this is that this is kind of deliberately eschewing basically every rule that does exist with, with right. the exception of a few <laughs> And I, I, I understand that, that is true, but in a way, part of my point is that is, although I see it's true, much less obvious t- uh, to me, I suppose. And I agree that, that jazz is best enjoyed, uh, with Morgan anyway, that I enjoy jazz best as an emotional exercise. Um, and it's because like earlier this year, I gave myself a crash course in, in jazz, which was just listening to a lot of celebrated jazz albums from various eras um, in chronological sequence. Um, and you know what? I enjoyed the John Coltrane that I listened to out of that. Um, and John, I, uh, the two artists that resonated with me most out of that was Miles Davis and John Coltrane, although I loved a lot of others. Um, I own Monin by Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers as well. Um, I think that's a 10 out of 10 record. I only um, played with them for a while, or at least on uh, one record. My um, local record says a Jazz Messengers record in it that I've been meaning to listen to because I think they're great and I want to own more. Um, but no, uh, and Miles Davis is someone who always um, put me in a position of just feeling emotionally hollowed out with every sound he made. Um, and look, I'm gonna put up no fronts. John Coltrane shits gold. Um, yep, damn like, straight. <laughs> this record is great. Um, but John Coltrane is someone who always, um, I suppose, even with my very experiential history with jazz, I had to intellectually process a bit more and then get the emotional impact, and that's fine, it's not better or worse, it's different. Um, and this record is sort of both ends at once, um, where there is a deeply intellectual application that it's obviously calling for, but also a deeply sit back and let it roll over you application. And it's sort of asking you to do both at once, but you can't do both at once. And that's part of what makes it such an engaging, and interesting listen, so that you have to process both. And I suppose I'm really glad that we are people who are more versed in in the musical theory history of jazz on this podcast, but I can only approach it from this made me feel a feeling. Um, And I love John Coltrane. I think Love Supreme is one of the best albums I've ever heard. Love Supreme is the definition of like jazz that makes you emotional. Like, because it's a Mm. record that is super emotional in every second of it. And it's Um, it's so intense and, and... also complex but also very visceral mm. um yeah it's it's very fucking good um but this is a different enterprise entirely i also thought of captain beefheart uh trout Mars replica which i of course recommended and had a very split reaction i um this will not probably be as split but um i can i can see i suppose better having listened to this what intellectually Beefheart was aiming for. Um, I think this is better. Um, that's probably not a controversial opinion. I don't really... Um, I, I'm, I'm still a bit confused on the comparison there. Like, just, just, the, the, just based on the inspiration from free jazz and taking different oh, ideas right, from right, it. Right, right, yeah, right. pretty much. Right. Breaking the rules, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. yeah. I have a quote from um, a guy called Dave Liebman, who I looked him up. He's a very well-respected jazz teacher and musician. Um, and he said that this album is the torch that lit the, the, uh, the touch paper for the, for the free jazz thing. And I suppose what he meant was, of um, course there were free jazz records before this, um, but he is saying, I think that this is the record that um, 
caused it to catch a zeitgeist and sort of blow up in a way. Um, and I have no idea if that's true, but he's a guy who knows his shit, so I'm, I'm quoting him. Um, the opening ensemble passage has these very beautiful opening lines. It feels like being invited to this beautiful fantasy world that, that Discord is then slowly sewn into as mm. the opening ensemble goes on longer. Um, and gradually um, building to this almost calamitous uh, cacophony of voices clamoring to be heard, um, which is a tone that the album almost maintains, alternating between different instruments having their moment in the spotlight. Um, it, almost, it almost feels like everyone is having a huge debate and being given a voice. Um, Coltrane solo at the beginning is crazed. It's very stop start. It's um, almost assaulting. Uh, and then we move back into the ensemble for a period. Um, there's one instrument giving haunting wailings in my left ear as a trumpet has a panic attack in my right ear. Um, I believe that's Pharaoh, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, very possibly. Um, but that brings me on to one of my best points about this album is that it is a masterclass in how to pan tracks in production. Um, just even with this cacophonous calamity of voices, the panning is what gives the record a cohesion and polish and mm. makes it almost like listenable and able to pick out melodic lines. It's so who we, who, yeah. sorry, I was, I was going to say who we have to thank for that um, and mentioned by name is the engineer, uh, Rudy Van Gelder who is a yes. legendary jazz engineer. Very, also, very en- also engineered uh, Love Supreme, because I, I, I just I bring this up because I read at length about him in the book I just read on that album. Uh, yeah, basically his work uh, in, in kind of putting together these sounds uh, is, is a big part of the reason why the sound has been so influential. Yes. Also, while, while we're addressing names, I incorrectly said earlier that Rashid Ali played on a Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers album. I was thinking of McCoy Tyner and said Ali on accident. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Um, but no, I think um, that if it wasn't for how well panned and mixed this record is, it would always be unlistenable. But it is uh, that element gives it such a listenability. It's just incredible how the music is transformed by that, in my opinion. Um, Dewey Johnson solo is scattering and kaleidoscopic. And then when Ensemble 3 comes in, it's like a brick wall that you're running into. It comes in with these sort of, this sort of almost like big band sound. John Coltrane actually said this record was deeply inspired by a big band sound, which a lot of people find baffling, and I understand why, but that does. There are a couple of moments where instruments play like a big band band. And I'm like, oh, I see what you mean, John. I see where that's coming from. Um, and this is one of those moments. Um, and it quickly goes into almost like quacking uh, um, uh, type thing, uh, the sort of squawking sound. Um, Pharaoh Sanders' is a solo, we have to talk about it. Mm-hmm. it is, um, when I can't remember who it was, they said that these people are playing like, like they'll never play their instruments again. This is the um, epitome of that on the record for me. Um, yeah. All I want to say is Pharaoh, every single time Pharaoh puts a tenor to his lips, that is how he plays, regardless of the context. And I want to emphasize um, the three great, I mean, I'm not like a jazz expert. I'm still discovering a lot of the deeper cuts in jazz. But the three mm-hmm. peaks, the three Everest-sized mountaintops of jazz music for me, uh, like in terms of um, both influence and impact for me personally are uh coltrane's a love supreme mingus's black saint and the sinner lady and Fero sanders karma so if you like Fero's solo solo here go and listen to karma that album will just change your life i you have not heard that. that yet and i will what record is it? that it's called karma, karma. Yeah. oh yeah I just downloaded like, like, it. Like George Michael's Chameleon. Anyway. Um, 
Jesus Christ. <laughs> and like and like Radiohead's police. <laughs> Very good. Um, but no, okay. first of all, um, his instrument pokes, prods, escalates, glides, jabs. It squawks all at once. It is insane. He almost makes his instrument feel broken and it's transcendent. Um, and then... Uh, the fourth ensemble section comes back in. Uh, it starts with these huge um, swinging drums, and then the bass comes in, like it's almost walking and it's prodding and it's poking, and it's just so rhythmic and melodic and satisfying. And then Freddie Hubbard, who I am a fan of independently of this album, I suppose all of these artists deserve that comment, um, but uh, Freddie Hubbard is an album called Ready for Freddie that I am a big fan of, um, was one of the more. Um, laid back sounding solos, which is, you know, all contextual. Um, but it glides around and has this almost like very sweet inserts amongst it. it it's one of the sweeter notes amongst the chaos this album is. And then Ensemble 5 comes in with drumming that epitomizes chaotic and it's wonderful. Um, Archie Shep makes this instrument sound like there's something evil trapped inside it that's struggling to get out. Um, it's just how I would describe the general tone of the tenor sax on this album, regardless of who's playing it. Right, but that's the big vibe I got listening to. Oh yeah, no, totally, totally, definitely. It's like yeah, it's, it's like watching, it's like listening to the chest burster scene, but John Hurt is instead a saxophone. Oh, I was thinking of um, oh. like the uh, what you know, an image, you know, what an image, you know, yeah. yeah. Your cunting daughter from The Exorcist. Uh, All oh, right, yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, that too. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ensemble Six is very like a big, loud brass sound, um, while other instruments are sort of just throwing their own little bits in. It's like, hello, hello, I'm here. Hello, hi. Um, and it's interesting. Uh, John uh, Chikai, um, lilts and ebbs, um, threatening to break out. And it's almost like straining against something holding a bat that he's constantly batting against. Um, and I think that's very interesting. Ensemble, the seventh ensemble part um, builds into another insane crescendo leading into Marion Brown's solo, um, which, again, his instrument sounds fucking broken in a great way. Um, again, more an, another uh, ensemble period, which is punishing McCoy Tyner, uh, my only note here is it's just magnificent, beautiful. There's no other way to describe this section than it's transcendently amazing. It's one of my favorite moments on the record. Um, and then you have your Art Davison, Jimmy Garrison duet, another highlight on the record. It almost sounds like a, a horror movie score that plucks and attacks and flows. And I feel like it's probably very influential on what a lot of contemporary horror movie scores are doing. Um, you have your Elvin John solo on the drums, and then the concluding ensemble, which is one of the longest sections on the record. Uh, it's, uh, it feels like a closing bow at the end of a play that has three encores, and it deserves it. Um, I suppose the overall vibe I'm trying to give with this review is that everyone is bringing their A game, and when you have 11 people bring their A game at once, of course it's going to sound cacophonous, it's going to sound difficult, but if you're willing to put in the time to give it the time of day, to give it the patience it asks for, God does it give dividends. And part of that is due to the fact that you were just listening to a hundred different lines of sound each of which is perfect. So if you just give yourself the headspace to listen to it, you could listen to it a hundred times and not get everything this record has to give to you and you would still love it every time mm. just because it has all of this inside it. Um, I'm not going to say it's for everyone. I think if you, if you are new to jazz, listen to other records first. Um, but if... It's uh, like recommending someone's first movie be climax <laughs> so true <laughs> it's just like but but um if you want if if you're in a place 
where you are able, not feeling able, if you're placed and you are actually able and know you are able to give this record what it asks of you, um, it will be like nothing else you've heard. Yeah. And I oh, yeah, just... also, I was wondering what, uh, what metal album should be the first metal album that I listened to. It's like, oh yeah, uh, Deaf Heaven Sunbather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. Um, I just want to add as well, like, um, if people are watching us because they're curious about Coltrane but haven't heard the record or haven't actually heard Coltrane, it's not where you should start, obviously. Nope. Um, but because uh, I, I do see a lot of kind of younger people who are kind of getting into jazz on, on Twitter and stuff, and they listen to stuff like this and the Old Atanji concert, which is the last recording of Coltrane that is a topic for another day. Let's just say that it makes this look like. Um, John Cage's 433. That's what that concert makes oh, this look like. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't listened to that and I haven't listened to uh, both directions at once, even though I have it on vinyl. Yeah. Um, just because I, I still need more before I go into those. Yeah, so, so definitely like educate yourself with some of the earlier Coltrane first and just get, because you can't really understand what is being done here without getting where it's come from. But yeah, you yeah, know, I mean, it, it is, it would be much like listening to Refused the Shape of Punk to Come without, <laughs> you know, having yeah. any wherewithal of punk music beforehand. Like, you, you might still enjoy it. It's a catchy ass record, but you will not really fully. Very, very, the, the exact same analogy. It's like if your first jazz record was Ornette Coleman's The Shape of Jazz to Come. Yeah. Yeah. It's just it's so much of it which is, is yeah. lost. Exactly. Anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. Jake, I believe it is your turn well, to speak on this album. Well, um, uh, no doubt um, I am totally the least versed in jazz of anybody on this podcast. Um, so... Basically, I wrote a good deal about this, and I am going to read it. That said, go in with the context here that I am doing this from the perspective of someone who is far less equipped to handle it like my podcast mates are, which is why this was such an interesting pick that I'm glad Morgan went with, because I get to offer my outsider perspective. Wait, is this your first so, Coltrane, Jake? Yeah, I mean, it, it's good that we have... Um, no, it is not my first Coltrane. Right. Uh, my first Coltrane was, I believe... My first Coltrane was in the Siberian uh, tundra. Let me stop you right there. Uh, mm, <laughs> stop you right there. Sir, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to... I'm gonna have to ask you to no, stop. It's, it's, it's good um, that we have different perspectives on this, or else it would totally. just be yes. me and Tyler nerding out. Yeah, my first Coltrane was Blue Train, uh, which I enjoyed oh. a lot. Um, one, oh, what? No, that's just like the furthest, the furthest Coltrane yeah. from this. It's really funny. Yeah, well, I mean, that's why I am at least glad that I heard that first, just because it totally gives you a view of what he is inverting and distorting in many ways. And again, I haven't really heard that many jazz records, as I will go into right now. Um, but, <clears throat> but I know what I know, my we all know what Jake's going to do after this, and it's going to be to go and listen to a Love Supreme, isn't it, Jake? No, absolutely. Well, Actually, I planned after reading this, my plan was to ask everyone here what jazz record I should go listen to next. Because... Actually, it, sh it it should be Giant Steps and then a Love Supreme. Yeah, okay. cool. yeah, I'll go. With I, that. I I have them both. I mean, I have been like, I, it's not. I'm not completely unfamiliar with it. You know, I did listen to shit. I, I listened to. Um, Birth of the Cool, I listened to In a Silent Way, I listened to Blue Train, I listened to the Mahavishnu Orchestra record that Tyler recommended, uh, and I've loved all of them so far. So, yeah. <clears throat> of the people on this podcast, I am perhaps the least versed in jazz. This is more out of apprehension than willful ignorance, mind you, as jazz music is, to make a very long story short, something that invokes primal anxiety in me that I cannot help. However, since we started the pod, taken an active effort to get more into it because you know 
you should, and I need to, because I need to fully flesh out my understanding of all music, and jazz is an essential core part of this. Uh, that said, I still approach this with a bit of apprehension, as it was, as Morgan put it earlier, uh, batshit. So, I braced for impact. The album immediately gives you no qualms about its intentions and assaults you with a wall of discordance. It may be my lack of knowledge in the genre, but I can only describe this as an assault of pure sound. Instruments completely out of tune with one another absolutely roar to life and continue marching forth with purpose, but that purpose is aligned only in and of itself. The waves of sound crash into each other and occasionally crest into a wave that goes in and out of sounding semi-harmonious and sometimes nearly entirely unrelated volleys of sonic trajectory. However, what separates this from the grating, scraping, near unbearable experience I had with, say, Captain Beefheart on an earlier episode of this podcast is the playing. I don't think the overall goal of these two albums is really all that dissimilar, as I think Coltrane's goal here, again, keep in mind, I have very limited knowledge of jazz, but I think Coltrane's goal here was to basically invert traditional jazz structures and rules, to break the formals in a way that, in any way that he could, with this assembly of a terrific jazz band, the likes of which I don't know if they've ever seen before or has been seen since, frankly, because of the talent at play. Uh, however, where the similarities end is with the stylistic verve on display. The instrumental performances themselves struggle to be called anything other than virtuosic. And while they can be lost amidst the chaos, latching onto specific solos and instruments as the album progresses is intensely rewarding. Each time I went back to this, I tried to follow along with a layout and guide to all of the solos and who was playing them, and I felt like I was looking at the blueprint to a magnificent building. My first listen, which was mostly just consisting of me and utter with bewilderment and even occasional frustration, evolved upon re-listen as trying to pick these out and seeing how they collapse on one another became an admittedly very fun exercise. Occasionally, you are given moments room to breathe before the stranglehold tightens its grip on you again. The drumming, which is of course undeniably the pinnacle of the form throughout, makes itself more present at the four minute mark, an utterly astonishing showcase of talent I have yet to see in all of music. When people say that jazz drummers are on a whole new level, this is precisely what they talk about, as the mix of both chaos and precision is admirable and occasionally jaw-dropping. That said, the drums here, courtesy of post-bop drummer Elvin Jones, are far from the only thing to admire. Pharaoh Sanders' solo that comes in at around the 12-minute mark is a work of utter madness, as the saxophone sounds like it is screaming, being strangled and battered as the drums cascade around him. It's like listening to someone try and break their instrument through just playing it, and just when you think he's out of steam, he keeps going. This approach honestly reminds me a lot of the Mars Volta's Bedlam and Goliath, where every single musician seen, sounds like they are a star that is threatening to collapse in on itself. Um, Coltrane and Johnson's contributions before this are worth noting, but it's here where the album rises from its primal chaos and finds more direction. Near the mid-13 minute and 14 minute mark, the drums are absolutely fucking assaulted, and the overwhelming noise feels as if it's going to consume the listener. And around the 15 minute mark, you're given room to breathe as the subdued piano and trumpet lead the album away from the density with which it started and go into something a bit more simple, yet no less impressive. Frederick Hubbard's trumpet work here is sublime, blasting out notes with unrepentant speed as the pianos and drums lightly tap with a fine timbre in the background. Through their play, though their playing still doesn't relent on being impressive either. It's here and select other moments where I find myself enjoying the record the most, as the clear production and outstanding playing feels like a gentle reprieve from the intensity of before that it ebbs and flows out of. But said reprieve does not last for long, as the 18-minute mark harkens back to the start, where we have battling saxophones and a more 
and more battered drum work, and it gives rise that feels not just claustrophobic, but like the track is trying to actively rob your lungs of air entirely. The second half starts off with a bit more focus, and as free saxophonist John Martin Chichai comes in with a wily and unruly solo that exhibits wide range and very little restraint. Further highlights are Marion Brown in the second half's first third, where a euphoric rise calls to mind the title of the record, where I feel almost as if I've been either beaten into submission or I'm actually beginning to feel some kind of jazz-infused trance where I can see the great fucking beyond. My absolute favorite segment of the record is the simplicity of the ever-skilled drumming complemented beautifully by Alfred McCoy Tyner's expert piano playing which has taken a back seat until now, but shows itself in a very beautiful way. The final six or so minutes kicking off with a terrifically ominous drum lead and bass work, the Davis and Garrison duet being a real show-stopping moment, the drums turning from these punchy and prickly sounding hits into something truly thunderous. The album concludes by the discordance of the opening returning, but folding into itself a bit more uniformly as the final two minute stretch sees it all coming together in a wonderful instrumental unity, like every part of the record thus far is now being played at the same time, blossoming and then folding in on itself once again. My experience with Ascension was both valuable and enjoyable, and I feel helped me overall with my ability to just comprehend jazz making me want to dive deeper into the genre, seeing all these all-time great instrumentalists collaborate under the command of one of the best to ever do it. It showcases the sheer raw potential of jazz music and music in general, and the raw brain matter expanding possibilities that it holds. I must admit, judging and evaluating such an experiential piece is really difficult for me, not only because of my inexperience, but just because I feel like something this nebulous, so reliant on the interwoven nexus of instrumental chaos and excellence, feels like it's missing the point. This is something where traditional scores in terms of ratings mean very little and showcase why the actual technical writing on music criticism is important and why mere numbers can't do an experience justice, hence why I felt I had to write this piece to distract myself from my thoughts just being inane ramblings of it's crazy and wild. Uh, while my musings have been overall very positive and exclamatory, I must admit that my appreciation for this is at a bit of a distance, as it's by design something that is a little bit too much to handle. And again, by genre experience, or my genre experience limits my capacity here to say anything that say a musical scholar couldn't say much better. But as someone who engages with this sound, I can say that it comes with many, or I can't say that it comes with many caveats and that its density though, isn't really for the faint of heart. It's a piece where no single part of it is unimpressive for a single solitary moment, but the way it all combines is where it finds itself and speaks to the idea that art is more than merely the sum of its parts. If I were one of those really boring film or music critics, I would give this album a perfect score because in isolation, nothing here is less than perfect. But when it comes to how the pieces interact, it becomes a question of how this affects what you process and how you process it. It is, again, by design, something that is meant to assault the senses and overwhelm. And in that regard, it does succeed. But it also does limit my enjoyment at points, even if my appreciation for it always bottomed out as being, well, near endless. It is a chaotic mix of pure talent. And if you value this kind of purity and the desire to be overwhelmed, this is a record you will get a lot out of. I would recommend listening to it with a guide, as well as listening to other canon jazz records first in order to get not only a grip on the genre, but the rules which Coltrane and co are breaking so that you can understand the heights that this achieves. But because I feel there's a lot of people who could write this off as being little more than lots of noise happening for 30 or so minutes, which is a vast, supremely limited view of an extraordinary musical experiment. Well said. Very good. Uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll read all. Uh, I was going to say I'll read all. Read all. I will read our techers liner notes. No, it's no, not for I'll like two weeks. Come on, I'll let's see these liner notes. Come I'll, on. Uh, Where are they? Then. 
What? Complete no line notes for all second, no lyrics? What are you talking about? What? Com- complete, Where is it? complete with surface noise. Uh, I will read August's review of this album in a minute. But one thing I just want to add, um, it's a quick consideration in terms of like what this record is going for. Like I know I, ter- I talked about kind of the religious aspect and the spiritual aspect and the kind of seeking transcendence sort of thing in my review. But let's reflect for a second on the title of the record, Ascension, in a Christian mm-hmm. spiritual context that evidently refers, although what's interesting, I don't know a lot about Coltrane specific um, beliefs, but they were more, I think, about... Um, it were less kind of specific to a religion, I think, and just more about God and, and um, divine power. But anyway, the ascension obviously refers to Christ's rising from um, and ascending to heaven after his resurrection. Um, so you can kind of see this record, I, I suppose, as like a soundtrack to that, like, or at least attempting to conjure that feeling uh, of, of this divine ascension uh, through music. And I think uh, that's um, perhaps, it seems to me based on the title, at least maybe what um, Coltrane is going for. But I'm curious if we do have any kind of jazz or Coltrane scholars watching this video, if you feel that there's any <coughs> context that, that we're missing here, please let us know in the comments section. Uh, with regard to that, I'd love to hear a bit more about it. I don't know quite as much about the history and, and backstory of this record as I do about I Love Supreme, so I'd love to learn more. Um, but yeah, anyway, that was just a, a bit of food for thought. Um, August review. When Morgan added this album to the Google document, I'd be lying if I wasn't just the slightest bit worried to go ahead and talk about a jazz album. I thought, what am I going to be able to say about this album with no real background in jazz? I guess what always seems so oppressive about jazz to new listeners is it's a genre where a lot of the intrigue comes from the technicality of the performances. However, after listening to artists like Miles Davis, John McLaughlin, and John Coltrane himself, I quickly dispelled that notion and realized that a lot of what's just so great about jazz is that it's entirely enjoyable on a visceral level, and knowing what's going on technically just aids that enjoyment. I bring all this context into the discussion being John Coltrane's ascension is the pinnacle of the fusion of visceral enjoyment and being able to gawk at technical achievement. This album is really just one long <laughs> song, and even calling it a song is a bit of a reduction. Ascension is more of a performance that you experience. It's 38 minutes are some of the bit. Be- uh, some of the best it's 38 minutes of some of the best musicians to have ever lived going absolutely ham on their instruments the album starts off reasonably enough with a slow build but what follows can only be described as things happening around <laughs> you cymbals crash trumpets roar saxophones swell and when enter john coltrane's tenor sax solo a manic flurry of notes lasting two minutes that manages to continue to ramp up the already existing tension in the air as the recording continues to feel louder and louder despite Coltrane being the only, um, the only brass player soloing. A true testament to his, it's not a brass player, but whatever, a true testament to his abilities and talents to command an orchestra and right off the bat, giving the listener the definitive statement that this is his album. The piece continues to build up anxiety as we reach Dewey Johnson's solo, which sounds something akin to trumpet notes being spat directly into your ear. You can almost hear the saliva being spread, so much so you might want to put on a mask just to be safe. One thing to be noted is Alvin Jones's drums sound ridiculously oppressive across the whole runtime and have a constant presence, making him a standout performer here. Uh, not that he is ever not a standout. 
Firo Sanders' tenor sax solo sounds like crazed screaming that just so happens to be layered over McCoy Tyner and Alvin Jones's drum and piano parts. Uh, Freddie Hubbard's solo takes occasional breaths in between long flurries of notes. While his solo keeps up the intensity, it also manages to have a very distinct sense of tunefulness to it. Uh, that leads me nicely to the point that Ascension is far from entirely a musical. The piece has a clear amount of work going into the tone and composition. Archie Shep's tenor sax uh, has a very distinct and rough growl to it that manages to set it apart from the other tenor sax solos we've had. So it's quite nice. John Tachai's alto sax solo sounds very nice, although in my opinion it ends up being the least memorable of the solos, but it's still really goddamn good. Marion Brown's alto sax solo is wild, anxiety building, and rather entertaining to listen to. Uh, McCoy Tyner's piano solo is maybe the most beautiful piece on this entire project. It sounds so elegant and is such a great calm down from the nearly 30 minutes of anxiety which preceded it. Uh, we have a duet next between Art Davis and Jim Garrison and uh, coming directly after Tyner's solo, it's one of the most single-handedly brilliant moments on the whole project. The tone of Tyner's solo is contrasted by the dark brooding tone of the bass duet. Uh, if that wasn't enough of a suite, you get it capped off with Alvin Jones's own drum solo, which lasts for 25 seconds and is maybe one of the best moments in all of Coltrane's work that I have heard. The sheer power, intensity, and impact of these 25 seconds is untouchable. And then it gives way to the final five minutes of Ensemble in such a satisfying way. Finally, the listener feels like they have truly ascended. At least I feel as though I did. What a brilliant experience. I guess my only gripe is that sometimes the ensemble parts can kind of feel like padding until the next solo. But honestly, who cares? It all sounds so awesome. Gets big thumbs Yee. up from August. Wow. Good so, review. I really feel like we got every perspective here, which yeah. is really cool. And every perspective landed on this being fucking great. Yeah. <laughs> so something, something I thought we could do here. Uh, if you want to, I kind of floated this idea earlier in the week. Since it's just one track, I thought instead of having yeah. favorite solos, we should say our three favorite solos. Um, I, I did mark those down um, for this. FYI, I have no least favorite solo. I'm not going to choose. That's um, fine. You don't yeah, I mean, like, how how could I presume to evaluate the quality of these solos? I mean, <laughs> fuck me. Yeah, sure. Um, so, Jake, do you want to go first? We'll go in order then. Yeah, sure. Um, my favorite solos, honestly, I gotta say my favorite uh, of them is Tyner, the piano. Uh, I'm gonna go with, uh, I know it's, t you know, it's not a solo by definition, but it, it is a part of this record. So it's the, the Davis and Garrison duet. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, closely followed up by Pharaoh Sanders. Uh, and it gets a strong eight from yours truly. Oh, nice. Good stuff. What does August give it? So August, let me get that back up again. Uh, August's favorite solos are Coltrane's tenor sax solo, Tyner's piano solo, and Jones's drum solo. Uh, August's least favorite solo is Tachai's alto solo. And August gives the album uh, an eight out of 10. Morgan. Okay, so my three favorite solos are um you know i'm i'm really gonna have to have to strongly uh, disagree with tyler and say that the elvin jones solo is uh while it is not necessary it is wanted and loved oh i'm glad it's <laughs> definitely i don't don't um to interpret it yeah no i didn't interpret it either, that way i just yeah words what do they what do, how do they work mm. um so yeah that's my number one um drums have always been the they're they're the thing that got me into jazz and just hearing maybe the best to ever do it do it by himself for even just 25 seconds or so is euphoric um yeah Followed by that, though, I'm going to say the Pharaoh Sanders solo, 
at the 11 minutes ish mark and it's between the Tyner solo towards the end and the Hubbard solo that's right after Sanders. And I'm not going to pick. Fuck you. They're both <laughs> great. Cool. Yeah. Oh, also a uh, strong nine. Nice. Oh, that's me. It's my turn. Hello. Um, my favorites in no particular order are Ferris Sanders, um, McCoy, Tyner and the Art Davis and Jimmy Garrison duet. It's getting a strong eight from me. Good shit. Uh, oh, just for Tyner. Let's go. Um, mm. So, uh, my favorite solo. So, my favorite solo is definitely Ferro Sounders solo. Um, not just because of the virtuosic and insane playing, but also it has my favorite moment on the album, which is, well, not moments, but just like the way in which Ferro basically eggs Alvin on. And you and like I mentioned, the drumming basically gets more and more intense during Pharaoh's solo to the point where they're almost kind of like rising in intensity together. That to me is like peak jazz right there. Mm. It's it's the it's the it's a moment of perfect um clarity and and like camaraderie uh, in, in this journey that is really special to me. Uh second favorite solo is Coltrane's own solo. And third favorite is Hubbard's solo. Um, and I am going to give this album... <laughs> I'm going to give this album 9 out of 10. Nice. Why you laugh? <laughs> I gave it a 9. No, it's because on the doc where we log it, August posted a comment about whether Tyler gives it a 10. Yeah, he said, does oh. Tyler give it the signature 10? Find out next signature. time on Dragon Ball Z Kai. <laughs> Anyway. Smart ass. Only fucking August would say Dragon Ball Z Kai, and he would, and he knows wow. only I would find that funny. So that got an eight point four on average, and for context, mm. that's the same score the Glowing mm. Man got. Good shit. Ooh, all right. And also, you know, I, I feel very similarly about both records. Hmm. Yeah. This is this is just a thing I'm curious about. Um, but does everybody have the uh, the record club of records that we've reviewed ranked? by your preference because i know i do and i know tyler does no i don't okay well then never mind um i was just curious as to what everybody's rankings would look like at this point in time we can i can give you i, I didn't make one I can, I can do it in the week and give it to you yeah we'll do we'll do it outside yeah, of recording. Okay. Yeah. um but yeah let i us can't know. believe me and august have the same fucking rating average for b-sides that's insane. that's insane jesus let us let us know uh, so yeah, let's leave this for our readers not to have to listen to since they have no idea what we're talking about. Yeah. Anyway, let us know what you think of John Coltrane's Ascension. What are your thoughts on Coltrane? Generally, what's your favorite Coltrane record? Um, yeah, dig us, dig into us at the comments below. Like, if you're a music theory person, you know a lot about the uh, more technical aspects of jazz. You can correct us if we said anything egregious. Um, but yeah, just let us know what you think of this album. Uh, next week on Record Club Review, we're going to be discussing Smash Mouth's Astro Lounge. So very much pivoting mm -hmm. from this. Um, and that's going to be fun. I look forward to it. Uh, yeah. It, it, look, look, I chose it because it is at least kind of vaguely historically important to culture. Um, and I think it's yeah, worth highlighting. I hate that you're not wrong. <laughs> uh, sure. So anyway. I uh, mostly just hate that you're making me do this. <laughs> Look, look, it can't be as bad as making you listen to Beefheart. That's no, it factual. can't. It, it can't, but I can still be mad. <laughs> okay. Rock over London, rock on Chicago, Victoria's Secret, a body for everybody.